Hello, today is August 21st, and I'm reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, these, again, is another chapter that deals with instructions for the last days. We believe we are living in the final days of humanity. Now, we know that according to the scriptures, last days actually started in the day of Pentecost in Acts You'll find this in Acts chapter 2, in which Peter himself said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last days. So last days is a period. It started at Pentecost, continuing to our day, intensifying its, uh, uh, the signs. And so we know now that we're getting down to uh, the very uh, end of uh, all of the things the Bible has been warning us about. It's escalate. We're living in that day in which uh, the signs of the times are all beginning to come together and the uh, uh, the birthing pains, you know, there are, are getting uh, more intense. Labor pains are getting more intense. Contractions are coming, getting closer together. Uh, so all of this creates a readiness, getting yourself ready for, his, his, for the coming of Jesus. Now, he begins in that first verse here in chapter 4, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, a lot of people like to suggests, hey, you know, God's not going to judge, that that was taken care of when Jesus died on the cross. He appeased the wrath of God. But the Bible is very crystal clear that there is a day established on which there will be a judgment, and not only a judgment of those who have not given their lives to Jesus, but we all will stand, the Bible says, before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're not going to be judged for our sins, but we will be judged for our life, what we did with our life, and it will be determination for the rewards. But I, what here is talking about is this judgment of the living and the dead. And there's two parts, and that is uh, the rapture and the kingdom, because he talks about at his appearing and his kingdom. So you've got both this rapture of the church that takes place and then the establishment of his kingdom. Now, we believe that there is the kingdom of God now, that we are a part of the unseen kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, but we also believe that there's coming a time of which his kingdom will be established and that there will be a earthly kingdom. Now, I know that there's some dispute about that, but with all ev evidence I find in the scripture, I believe that it is very difficult to get around the realities of that. And establishment of an earthly kingdom. Now look what he says in verse 2, preach the word. I like that verse. And then he says, be ready in season and out of season. So because you know what? We, we have, there are seasons of our lives and, and, and it just speaks about being ready, being prepared. And especially the seasons as it leads up to the return of Christ. So just be ready. And he says, convinced, rebuke, um, exhort, uh, for the time's going to come, what he says, verse 3, for the time's coming when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. So we, and we're watching this now, and this is the corruption that we find in filtering the church. Now, the Bible tells us that judgment's going to begin in the house of God. And we're finding that, obviously, God is purifying the church in this day, getting us ready because he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. So that we're watching ourselves going through this this cleansing stage, this purification stage. And uh, and we find the separation between God's church and the world's church, and you know, the, this man church that, that, that exists today. And so, uh, but it's this issue of sound doctrine. And he talks about itching ears. And we know this is true, that we are, we have preachers and churches, and you can tune into them everywhere, that are knowing just how to scratch and just how to itch. And, and it attracts people to them because it's a gospel that appeals to the flesh. It's a gospel of ease, a gospel of, of promises, you know, of how it will benefit us. And, uh, and so we're being warned about this, that uh, it's not going to be sound doctrine. And, uh, and that you and I, they're going to bring teachers around them that speak what they want to hear. And then verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Boy, and that's apostasy. That's what we talked about in the last couple chapters, is that we're living in the hour of apostasy in which people are turning away. And apostasy is turning away from the foundational historical teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ that have been, been solid pillars of the church for 2,000 years. And, and we're watching those things erode away. Don't turn away away from the truth and the, the uh, solid foundation of the Word of God. And then he says, verse 5, but you, 
be watchful. This is the contrast. In all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We all have callings. We all have gifted, gifts, giftings. And so while some of us may be preachers or pastors or evangelists, there's others of us. We all have gifts. We have all have the mark and seal of God in us. And there's a mission that God has for you. And every day that you go to work and every, every uh, place that you meet people, there is a mission at hand. And it may be your neighbor. It may be some business. It could be, you know, a family member, but you and I are to uh, seize every opportunity and to do the ministry of what? Introducing people to Jesus Christ. Now look what he says as Paul talks about, this is a deathbed testimony almost right here uh, of Paul where he says, I I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And he says, uh, you know, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that it was getting close. He knew that that he sensed it, he felt it. I've, I've been around a lot of people that can get a sense that uh, their time is coming to a conclusion. They're getting ready for heaven. They, they feel like that, that the, uh, and I think that God has a way of preparing us, of knowing, and Paul's sensing this. He, all that he's done, his mission, his sacrifices, he's been, he's surrendered so much, and yet he's feeling like it's, and he, he affirms it, I've, I've fought the good fight. Of all the trials and all the things that Paul, you know, was confronted with, he did fight a good fight. And, and it's, an, it's an encouragement to all of us, an admonition to all of us, that we are to, and he said, I finished the race. He's, and, and we're all in that race, and we're all fighting that fight. And, and, he, and, and he said, I've kept the faith and how important it is not to get discouraged. Don't let the world and the chilly breeze of culture rob you of your vitality and your passion and your, and your faith. So, so that's why. And he says, verse 8, finally, there's a, laid up for me the crown of righteousness, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day, which is what he's talking about, the return of the Lord, the end of all things, the day of the Lord. And, and then, but thank God for this, not only to me, but to also to all who've loved his appearing. We've got to look forward to his coming. You know, the Bible talks about this. It, don't dread it. In fact, we're supposed to comfort one another with these words. But the fact is, is we're giving our very best friend. It can become the motivation of how you live your life when we realize that things are getting late, that we're like the virgins, but we make sure that our vessels are filled with oil, that we're not caught unprepared, that the thief which will come in the night, that we're not, we're not asleep and we're not intoxicated by the things of this world. And so the, in the encouragement here, Paul says, here's what I've done and here's what you're gonna have to do. And, uh, and the fact is, is that we're going to receive that crown of righteousness. We're gonna, we're gonna step across the threshold of glory in the coming when we fly through the air, and we're gonna be, we're gonna, we're gonna be glad that we didn't get cave, we didn't get lose heart, we didn't fold, but we clung to the promises of God. And then he does, he, he gives a list of, of believers in this chapter. Uh, in, in the first century. And some of them were good and some of them weren't so good. He talks about uh, Damas has forsaken me uh, there in verse 9. And, and he talks about how he has in many ways abandoned the faith. He's, he, he's loved this present world. He's departed. And, and, and so I think that as Paul builds the case of why it's so important for you to keep the faith is that he's got this backdrop of individuals who were drawn into teachers having itching ears who are sucked into apostasy. And he says, uh, and you can hear the pain as he talks about how this is grieving him, that not only did they abandon him, but the fact that the world caught them, that they were snagged in the deceitfulness of the world. He does talk about Luke, faithfulness of Luke. He talks about Mark bringing him because he's been so useful to him in ministry. And he talks about Alexandra, though, that, that uh, the coppersmith who'd done him much harm. So even though you're a man of God and you're in living Jesus, it's evident you're going to experience disappointment and relational conflicts. It happened to the greatest. And then, uh, but yet he talks uh, and he says, beware of him because there's a spirit, right, attached to those kind of individuals. Look what he says, verse 16. This is about forgiveness. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Boy, it's just the nature of Jesus. I'm telling you what, it's so easy to get bitter. It's so easy to have unforgiveness. It's so easy to demand to be vindicated. But the spirit of Christ is to release offenses. 
to release the offender, to do what Jesus did, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, to do what Stephen did, in which he says, don't hold this against them, and we're going to have to be willing to have a clear conscience and not allow individuals that are talking about us, hurt us, wounded us, and misrepresented our reputation to in any way cause or allow a root of bitterness to spring forth in us. And then finally he says in verse 17, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And doesn't, isn't that all that matters? Is that we have Jesus with us? That we know that we have, and doesn't, all, everybody else can forsake us. Everybody else can turn on us. But oh, if we have Jesus, that's all that really matters. And then he concludes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom and him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's for you and that's for me because it's for sure. It's an absolute that God's going to preserve us for his coming and he's coming soon. Get ready. It's almost time.